message in our happiness series. Awesome. Okay. Amen. Okay. We began by saying that those of us who were poor in spirit yeah. were blessed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We began by saying that those who mourn will be comforted. Yeah. Then we learned that we're blessed because we're meek. Yeah. We shall inherit the earth. Yeah. We found out that we were blessed when we hungered and thirsted after righteousness yeah. because we will be filled. Yeah. Yeah. We were blessed because we're merciful. And when we're merciful, we will obtain mercy because we have obtained mercy. We're blessed when we're pure in heart, for we shall see God. Yeah. Last week, we learned that because we're children of God, we're peacemakers. Because oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. we're peacemakers, we are the sons of God. Yeah. 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 We're blessed. We're blessed. Blessed means happy. It means to be happy because of our place in God, regardless of outward circumstances. Jesus was telling them that they were blessed by these standards because blessing by the standards they were living in were based on their outward circumstances. Yeah. As long as you follow the ceremonial law, right. you were blessed. As yeah. long as you looked good and things were going right for you, you were blessed. I said in the very beginning, I always had a problem with the only understanding of being blessed is what was going well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I have a problem with that. Yeah. yeah. Because things don't always go right. 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 And just because things aren't always going right yeah. doesn't mean you're not blessed. Right. Matter of fact, sometimes we're more blessed when we're going through and when things aren't going right because we learn something about our relationship with God. Yeah. 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 And so Jesus was telling them, this, you're blessed, you're blessed, you're blessed regardless of what's going on because of what is happening in your character. Yeah. Yeah. You're blessed. Yeah. Yeah. All of these things lead us up to this final aspect of blessing, which seems to be the most <laughs> contradictory of what sounds like blessing. Because it tells us in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he goes on to say, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Yeah. Now, we might have been able to be all right with being blessed because we're poor in spirit. Yeah. Right. Feel all right yeah. about being blessed because we mourn. And being blessed because we got to break up some fights and be peacemakers. And we, we might be able to navigate through all that, but hold on, Pastor. This, 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 this persecution. Yeah. It's going to sound like something I want to be blessed by. Right. It doesn't feel very blessed. But Jesus said, we're blessed. Yeah. I'm reminded of a quote by the Bishop Polycarp, the contemporary of the Apostle John, the new Apostle John personally. He was a bishop of Smyrna between 70 and 155 AD. And he was urged by a Roman proconsul to renounce Jesus Christ, or else he would be killed. And he said in response, at the face of death, eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How then 
can I blaspheme my king and my Savior? All right. Yes. He said, I'm blessed. Yes. Because of my relationship with God. Oh, yes. yeah. Oh, yeah. And so I cannot renounce him. He was burned at the stake. The question becomes then, are you prepared? Are you willing to take such a stance in the face of persecution? It's a hard question to ask because in the world we live in now, we're not faced with that type of persecution. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Persecution in the Greek is dioko. Dioko, it means to pursue, it means to follow, it means to press toward, it means to put to flight, to drive away, to pursue in a hostile manner, to pursue in a way to harass and to trouble and to mistreat. It means repeated acts of enmity. Yeah. We learned on Tuesday that enmity means hostility or hatred. In other words, persecution is the active and violent attempt to drive you away from your faith. All right. All right. Yes. Amen. It means there are those out there that are pursuing every opportunity to quiet and silence your testimony. Yeah. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Yeah. Righteousness, dikaiosune, dikaiosune, it means equity of character. It's the state of him who is as he ought to be. It means you live in the way you're supposed to be. Yeah. To be in the condition acceptable to God, it is the doctrine concerning the way in which man may attain a state approved of God. It is integrity, it is virtue, it is purity of life, it is rightness, it is correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. So we are blessed when we are persecuted for living right. 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 If you haven't been persecuted for living right, then you might want to check how you live. So there are three things I want to talk about in terms of this understanding of being blessed under persecution. First, we're going to talk about persecution. Then we're going to talk about praise. Then we're going to talk about promise. Persecution, praise. And promise. Now, when he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, this persecution refers to outward acts of violence. But we see biblical examples of this. You can write these down, but in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, it says, Now about the time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. That was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Violent acts by the Roman Empire of persecution against Christians. Paul talked about his own persecution in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, but I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. For the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. In other words, he was whipped with 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. 
in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Paul was persecuted yeah, yeah. for righteousness' sake. Right. We even hear about Stephen, the first martyr in Acts chapter 8. Before Paul was Paul, he was Saul, and he was consenting to Stephen's death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. There was persecution in the church at that time. But let me tell you something. There's persecution for Christians today. And I mean violent persecution. North Korea is known for its harsh, harsh persecution for any religious practice outside of their sanctioned systems. They could be imprisoned, placed in forced labor camps, or executed. In 2021, when the Taliban took, returned to power in Afghanistan, Christians had to go back to hiding their faith secretly because they could be killed for their faith. In Somalia, Christianity is considered a Western religion, and so they're strongly opposed by militant groups like Al-Shabaab, and conversion from Islam could result in execution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In India, even though India has a constitutional protection for religious freedom, Hindu nationalist groups are known to harass and violently persecute Christians in that region. So you don't think Christians are persecuted today to that degree, the way Paul was and the way James was. We're sadly mistaken because we're so insulated in our American protection of religious freedom, we don't realize that there are Christians out there that for owning the Bible could be beheaded. For just proclaiming the name of Christ could be burned and killed or stoned. Violent persecution exists today just like it did in the Bible. Yeah. But then he goes on to say, blessed are those when they revile against you and speak all manner of evil against you, revile. On I did so, it means to defame, it means to rail, it means to taunt, it means undeserved reproach, to be disparaged, it means to assail with abusive words and those who speak all manner of evil against you. This might be the type of persecution we here in the West are more familiar with. They might not go and beat you or whip you or yet throw you into prison, but they'll talk about you. They'll talk about your stance. They'll tease you for your stance. They'll, they'll, they'll call you all kinds of names. Yeah, yeah. They'll mock your integrity. They'll mock you for wanting to be, uh, 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 to not be sexually promiscuous. They'll mock you for not wanting to engage in, in all kinds of debauchery, which has become normalized in this country. They'll talk about you and they'll tease you. Yeah. This level of persecution speaks of verbal persecution, legal persecution, public accusations, which though totally unsubstantiated, the secular world will use them to destroy Christians. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, this kind of persecution is what places us in fear because we would rather be approved by the world than be approved of God. Yeah. We would rather the world be okay with our Christianity as long as our Christianity is okay with them. Right, right. We're 
We're being slandered in America. Yeah. We're being slandered in the West. We're mocked as believing in fairy tales and antiquated ideas. Students are told that they can't pray on their own school anymore. Right. They're told that they can't read their Bible, even if they're reading it all by themselves, but they'll place some other types of books in the library for them to read. I read a story of one high school football coach that was fired for praying in public after a football game. Now here's the thing. We're not being persecuted for believing. We're being persecuted for practicing. You're right. There you go. They don't care if we believe. Yeah. They just don't want to see us do it. Right. They don't care if they, we believe. They just don't want to hear us talk about them. Yeah. People don't care what we believe. They just don't want to hear us share it. They don't want to see us do it. Why? Because our practice of righteousness is a conviction to the world. Yeah. yeah. All right. Our practice and our right standing with God tells the world that they're not doing something right. So the only way they can quiet their conscience is to criticize us, yeah. is to, de to, to, to demonize us, to tell us that our way of thinking is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But Isaiah said, woe to those who call good evil and call evil yeah. good. Yeah. We're living in a world that normalizes and celebrates sin as good and as free and as and, and tolerant. And, and the only way you can be a good Christian is to love me regardless of what I do. That's the type of Christianity they want. They want a Christianity that sits down, is quiet, and don't tell me about myself. They criticize us. They demean us. And they make us feel bad. They call us names. We don't like to be called names. And so we compromise. We skew the scriptures just a little bit to be palatable to the world so that we don't get criticized and called names. And yet there are Christians across the sea who are being beheaded while we're scared to stand for righteousness because of some name calls. But Jesus said, but blessed when men shall revile you, when they talk about you, when they criticize you. And those of us who are younger, we go on to college and we're going to be persecuted in that way. You're going to be talked about in that way. We have to make the decision on whether we're going to continue to stand for righteousness. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there, may, there are many who go by in it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. It's the difference between driving on I-10 and driving on a two-lane highway. <laughs> and even though I-10 can get congested, it's still a wide road and a whole lot of cars can fit on I-10. But not many can drive down those small roads. It's harder to drive down those small roads. And yet Jesus says, those are the roads that lead to life. It's easy to get an easy tag. It's easy to get on the freeway and, and drive freely. But it's hard to take those side roads. I'd rather get there the easy way. That's the way the world wants us to live. That's the way we Christians want to live. We want to go on the highway. We want to go on the Broadway and still call ourselves Christians. But the, the life way, the Christ way, is not the easy road. It's not the easy road. It's narrow. We need to be narrow-minded Christians. That sounds bad, but I, I think we need to be narrow-minded Christians. We need to stick 
to what the Bible says. We need to stick to what our doctrine is. We need to stick to what our faith says, regardless of who criticizes us, regardless of who talks about us, regardless who tries to do away with it. We have to recognize that there is only one way, and that is Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yeah. It's a narrow way, but it's a necessary way because it's a way that leads to life. So believing doesn't get you persecuted. Mm -hmm. Practicing does. Living it does. Declaring it does. Being a Christian according to biblical standards, not by your own standards, not by the, the, the way the politics tries to tell you we should be good Christians and, and how secularism tries to tell us we are good Christians. No, not by worldly standards. No, standards that compromise with the world so that we look more appealing is not the standard. We don't seem as bad. We don't seem as bad when we look better to the world. So I'll challenge you. If the world is happy with your faith, you might want to check your faith. If the world applauds your Christianity, then you might want to take a few looks in the book again. Because the world would not approve of the doctrine that we live. So we don't, we're not persecuted for believing. James 2 and 19. He says, you believe there is one God, you do well. That's all right, you believe there is one but God, but guess what? Even the demons believe yeah. and tremble. Yeah. So ask yourself a question, what makes you different from a devil? How do you separate yourself from a devil? If a devil believes, then what difference is there between you and them? It is your life. It is your walk. Yeah. It is your consistency. So listen to those of us who are persecuted, whether violently or verbally, but it goes on to say, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So rejoice in verse 12. That doesn't sound like something to rejoice over. It doesn't sound like in the, at the prospect of being imprisoned or at the prospect of being sued or at the prospect of being talked about that I would celebrate it. But it says rejoice, be joyful, be happy, be exceedingly glad. In other words, make an outward expression of your joy in your persecution. Wear your persecution as a badge of honor. We do it now in our social justice mindset when we talk about making good trouble. We talk about those that walk with Dr. King and they were beaten with Dr. King. They wear it as a badge of honor. When they talk about going to prison at that time, and, and even today, those who are talked about and, and criticized for their stance of, of social justice, and, and they wear that as a badge of honor because they know what they were doing it for. Wear your persecution for righteousness sake. Wear your persecution for Christ's sake as a badge of honor. We should be honored to share the same privilege of suffering for our faith the way our forefathers did it, the way our biblical forefathers did it. He said, the prophets before you were persecuted. So you're going to be persecuted. Yeah. Jesus was persecuted. So you're going to be persecuted. So we're not, but, but we're not rejoicing in the fact that we're being persecuted. We're rejoicing about what we're being persecuted for. We're persecuted for standing for what's right. We're persecuted for living out our faith for Jesus Christ. We are persecuted for a reason. We are persecuted for a purpose. We're not rejoicing in the persecution. We're rejoicing in the purpose of our persecution. And that's a purpose worth living for. That's a purpose worth dying for. Mm -hmm. Persecution, John Piper says, this persecution is not simply about being oppressed by others. It's also about how we endure mm. that oppression. Mm how we endure it, how we rejoice, how we receive it. 
how you embrace it. We're living with first world problems today. We're living in a world where slight inconveniences bother us. And we don't think about how others in the world are suffering for their faith. We need to realize, as I've said before, Christianity isn't a church religion, it isn't American religion, it is a world of faith. And so what I preach here needs to preach in Japan. What I preach here needs to preach everywhere. It has to match everything in this Bible. It has to translate everywhere. My faith needs to be the same thing that goes everywhere else. And so we need to also respect what our brothers and sisters around this world may be facing for their faith. I'm not being needy. I'm not being talked about. But would you? Would you? If it came down to it, where would you stand? Acts 5, 40 and 42 speaks of another example of persecution. And it says, and they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. The apostles were celebrating the fact that they were chosen to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. And guess what? They didn't stop. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So in our persecution, the way we handle it is not complaining. The way we handle it is not finding a way not to be criticized. It's going to happen. The way we handle it is rejoice. The way we handle it is embrace it. The way we handle it is accept the reality that the world ain't going to like you, and that's okay, because we are blessed by Jesus, not by them. Praise in your persecution. And not only do we praise and rejoice, for the purpose of our persecution, but we rejoice in the promise of our persecution. We are promised to possess the kingdom of heaven. We are going to possess a future kingdom because we're living out kingdom principles today. We're living out our kingdom principles today and we're suffering from them. And because of that, we will possess kingdom permanence. What we live today are principles that we will inherit and receive in the future. We rejoice. Not only that, we will rejoice because we will receive the promise that our forefathers never saw. Jesus said the prophets before you suffered. The prophets before you were persecuted and they were persecuted for a promise that they never saw. They were persecuted for a Messiah that they never lived to see. They were persecuted for a covenant promise that they never lived to enjoy. Hebrews 11, 36, in the infamous Hall of Faith, he talks about all the examples of faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and, and so on, and Sarah, and, 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 and Rahab, and so on and so forth. But then he goes on to say in verse 36, still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So you know what the promise is? The promises, the, 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 the promise that we receive is on behalf of those that died before us. We talk about by today's standards going to vote because our forefathers died for that right. And so we don't take advantage of our right and privilege to vote 
because folks before us died for it. And so we are fulfilling a very thing that they worked hard for us to receive. And so in the same way, our forefathers died for a covenant promise that they never saw. And now we are going to experience and receive that same very covenant promise. Don't let their death be for nothing, but rejoice in that same persecution. Because we are going to realize the very promise that they died for. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So let's stand firm in the fire of persecution. Because with it comes a promise. A promise from God, a promise of possessing the kingdom, a promise of a reward, a promise fulfilled on behalf of our forefathers that suffered before us. So don't fear and don't falter in the face of adversity. It's going to happen. Yeah. But when it does, he'll be our shield and our protector. Rejoice, rejoice because your faith outshines the darkness of that oppression. So while we are fighting the flames of persecution, at the same time, sing songs of praise to your Savior. Because he walks with us. He walks beside us. He keeps us. He stands with us. And he gives us the strength to endure. And if we look forward to the promise, then we can endure the persecution. If we look forward to the kingdom, then we're willing to be killed. If we can look forward to heaven, that will go through persecution of hell. We will do it because we have something bigger to look forward to. I'll leave you with these scriptures. James 1 and 12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he is tried, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Listen, we look at trials and tribulations today differently than what the trials and tribulations they dealt with now. Your car don't start in the morning. That's a trial and tribulation to you. You got a little more month at the end of the money. That's a trial and tribulation to you. You wake up with a little back and knee pain. That's a trial and tribulation to you. Trial and tribulation in the Bible was waking up, worried about whether you were going to die that day because you believe in Jesus Christ. They're not the same. That's the trial and tribulation he's talking about. Those are the stresses he's talking about. Not because somebody ticked you off at work. The trial and tribulation that the Bible speaks of is enduring the persecution that was pursuing you day after day after day. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life. And then Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. For if we endure, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. First Peter 3, 10 says, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord are against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Romans 8, 17 and 18 says, we're children of God. And if we're children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together with him. In other words, if we're willing to suffer Christ's suffering, then we'll experience Christ's 
glorification. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And so if we focus on the glory, then we won't be consumed by the glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Rejoice. Rejoice. Our persecution might be a trial on earth, but look at it this way. It's also an investment in your promise of eternity. Mm -hmm. What we deal with today is only temporary when we compare to the great glory that we look forward to tomorrow. Amen. So I challenge each and every one of us, even myself, how will you stand in the face of persecution? How will you stand when somebody wants to criticize and demean and mock your faith, your stance, for righteousness, your life, your purity. How, how will you respond? Will you compromise? Will you reel it back? Will you decide to say nothing or will you decide to give a defense for those who ask you the reason for your hope? That time is coming at some point, especially for our young people. Especially for our young people because Christianity today is an option. Church is an option. It's one of many. If you choose not to listen to a certain kind of music, if you choose not to speak a certain kind of way, if you choose not to attend certain types of events and so on and so forth, and you decide to, here's what's funny. You can say, no, I don't do that just because I don't want to. It's like, okay, that's cool. You don't have to do that. But if you say, I don't do that because I'm a Christian, Oh, you're crazy. Why is it that my faith makes my morality a problem? That's what we have to be prepared for. You're not moral because you're moral. You're moral because you're saved. And that is what convicts people. That's what convicts the world. That's what wants them to shut us up. Because our life tells them that their life is not right. Instead of accepting it, they want to kill it. And that's where persecution comes from. We have to decide how we will respond to it. We have to decide how we will face it. And us as parents need to prepare our children and embed in our children and instill in our children the consistency of faith that they should have and be prepared and help them and guide them and encourage them because that persecution is coming. More now for them than it probably was for us. So we have to be that preparation for them because that persecution is coming. The doors of the church are open at this time.